everyone. I'm Amanda Kasseri, a researcher and engineer on Google's Open Source Programs Office team. It's a pleasure to be with you today to briefly talk about the very large body of work that is cultivating more diversity in open source ecosystems. At Google, we strongly believe that open source is for everyone. We actively work to identify and remove barriers to open source community participation and contribution. We've invested for decades to grow the open source community and expand access to as many people as possible. And as hard as we work, we know these efforts do not reach everyone. We know that we have gaps in our understanding, in our ability to reach people, and in the limitations of our own constraints. So as we try, learn, and grow, how do we know we are reaching as many people as possible? And how do we know who is being left behind? This is where we have to do the complex nuance work of understanding people, how they identify, and what makes them feel connected. We know that we will never achieve a balanced representative ecosystem without considering human connection. If our goals focus solely on single factor surface level diversity statistics, we will fail to capture the many intersectional identities and the barriers they continue to face, which keeps them from finding a place in open source that feels like belonging. And so to know where we are and how we can do better, we have to measure our efforts and the impacts that they make. Diversity must be pursued with intentionality and so must measuring it. We can learn from the work of organizational scientists such as Professor Quinetta Roberson, which focuses any measurement of diversity, equity, inclusion on an organization's how and why. The why for, for Google is clear. We want everyone to have access to open source communities and the ecosystems they create. The how we measure is much more challenging. Our current picture of open source has many known gaps. Researchers and analysts continue to over-index measuring participation in and representation of open source communities based on changes to code and repositories. Not only does this actively exclude all other work that exists outside of a pull request, it also incorrectly assumes repository metadata as a source of truth and historical record. We also see non-representative surveys, use, usually conducted by technology platforms, continue to be quoted as a baseline census for who is present, interested in, and working in open source. Continuing to use this kind of information, especially from spaces known to be exclusionary to the very people we want to include, does not send a message which allows others to see mirrors of themselves or windows into open source. The good news is that we have so many people like you who continually believe that inclusive spaces are worthy of our time, attention, investment, and energy. And while cultivating diversity in open source ecosystems is a very large body of work, we have some good starting points. Feminist geographer Joni Seeger once said that what's get, what gets counted counts. So to do better in measuring open source ecosystems, we have to ask what we are counting and for whom. What is the criteria we are using to define a contribution to an open source project. In machine learning and AI, how are we evaluating and tracking the work that is data set curation, maintenance, and documentation as essential to advancing technology? How do we value and invest in and give credit for design work in open source? Whose skill sets are represented when we measure open source and whose are left out? Much of my current work in Google's open source programs office is centered on data feminist principle number seven, make labor visible. And while I know from experience that not every space or community in open source is free of barriers or toxicity, I also know that we can never grow more diverse, equitable, and inclusive communities until every person feels like their work is important, valued, visible, and essential to the long-term sustainability of open source. And so here is the part where I get to ask you for help. First, I would like to encourage you to find your open. Open source software is absolutely essential in our modern technology world. However, there are many other opens which are part of the ecosystem. Open data makes it possible for us to see, understand, and critically evaluate applied research and the assumptions it makes about our world. Open standards make the creation of technology available to everyone rather than relegating it behind expen expensive proprietary standards. Open governance ensures many seats at the table deciding on the path forward that impacts a global industry. And there's more. 
Open models decrease the obfuscation outcomes obtainable only from high computational resources. Open science lowers the barriers to scientific understanding and exponentially increases communication in crisis situations. Open communities create spaces for people to find themselves, one another, and a place to explore their future. And I know there is endless need, and there's only one of each of you. So I want to emphasize that your time and skills are valuable and deserve to be spent in a community who values you and lifts you up. So when you find that place, I would encourage you to bring others along with you so we can do better together. Thank you. Uh, I'll be taking some questions now from the Q&A. So if there's anything you would like me to have a go at, um, please go ahead and submit them and I'll start going with ones that are already submitted. Um, so first off, uh, how can students get involved in open source software? Uh, my first suggestion for getting people involved in open source software, if you're a student, uh, is the Google Summer of Code. Uh, it's a program that's been running for I think, 25 years now. I might be off on that, uh, but it's been running for a long time. And 2021 is our, um, is our just wrapped up. Uh, there's going to be some really wonderful um, new features coming to the program next year. So I highly encourage everybody to uh, get involved with that or check it out either as a student or as a mentor. Um, there's a lot of wonderful projects that, that work on that. Um, the second question is, um, do I have any ideas on how to quantify and measure open source software contributions. I always have a hard time justifying and pitching resources for open source software work. I'm so glad that somebody asked this question. Uh, I have many thoughts on this. Um, a lot of the work that's done, as I talked about previously in open source software contributions, typically get measured by uh, platforms or repositories live online. Um, and this isn't because there's not ways to measure or quantify other kinds of contributions. It's just been the way that's been most publicly visible for a long time. It's also the way that maybe researchers do when they're trying to collect information at scale to answer a scientific question, um, but doesn't answer all of the other kinds of work. Um, so I like to encourage people to go back to um, kind of that again, that why and that how. So why are you doing this work and what kind of impact is that having? So if you can start to uh, tie things back into a mission, into a reason, um, if you can talk about um, the work that you are doing because of the why that you're doing it, then you can start to understand, here's what I'm doing, here's why I'm doing it, and then start to see if I want to put something that would be like a little observer on that. Um, what is it something I could do that would be able to give me some indication that I'm doing a good job? Um, so I'd actually recommend uh, for that framework breakdown, uh, Julia Ferrioli and I gave a talk earlier in the year at FOSS Backstage. Um, it's called Preventing Random Acts of Metrics in Open Source Ecosystems. And it's a basic framework for developing metrics uh, that are useful for open source. So I'd like to refer people to that in case that you are interested in learning more about that. Um, let's see. Uh, next question, I see um, somebody asked, I want to be a machine learning developer. How do I start? This is a great question because machine learning developer can be the same role that does a lot of different jobs. Um, the way that I would recommend for someone to start with that um, is if you don't yet have a background that allows you to break um, problems apart into smaller chunks and understanding where to start there, um, this is really the key fundamental skill that most machine learning developers have is being able to answer, look at some bigger problem. Is there any kind of pattern that you can see that you can turn that into a question that could be answered with machine learning? And then how do you frame that into a problem that could be solved with machine learning? So working on problems like that, that allow you to start seeing something bigger, turning that into a question that could be answered with machine learning, breaking that down into smaller components. Um, there's really good books that describe these processes as well. Um, they talk about machine learning pipelines, about getting into a data source, a data science mindset. Um, and so if you are interested in that holistic view, I, I encourage to check out some of those free resources. Um, there's also a really great online um, project, which 
the name escapes me right now, but I think it's like uh, it's like the free data science master's program. Um, so this wonderful person uh, a few years ago um, created uh, a website which gathered all of the free resources and all of the skills and developer um, needs that you might have to build out um, what is essentially a free master's program. Um, and so if there, you can find different components of that that are interesting for you, um, it'll also help you find communities that you may share those interests with so you can work with them and talk more with them about what is important. Um, so next I see somebody asked, how can I showcase to my employer that open source contributions matter and it is important? This is a question we work hard on at Google to help every person connect their many contributions back to what is important to their team and their work. And for this, I, I again, I recommend that you start from a place of understanding, do you know what is important to your team, to your organization, to your employer? So what are the different levels that you work within in a group? Um, what is important to them? How does that connect to what is important to you? And is there a component then within your work that you can draw analogies to and show that this is impactful for your employer? Um, so I think that it's, it's this idea of how are you phrasing it or how are you drawing the lines between what is important to a person, an organization, a role, um, a team, versus what is important to you and trying to get those things to align. And if it's tricky because maybe you're working on something very deep in open source that may or may not have a direct line back to your team, that's where it gets a little more complicated. But if you're working on something like a library, an operating system, um, a programming language, if you're building things uh, to be able to connect your employer's technology stack, to the wider open source ecosystem. This is where it gets a little easier to draw those connections. Um, other ways that we uh, like to encourage people to think about or promote this work, which sometimes works, is not necessarily trying to represent everything as economic capital. So because open source is a socio-technical system, uh, we can't ignore the human component which means not everything translates into dollars, even time, not everything translates into dollars. So why we spend our time in open source and what we spend our time on may not always translate into immediate economic gain or loss. Um, sometimes it's something like risk reduction, uh, which we don't always represent with an economic model. Um, so I would encourage you to think a little bit about how do you draw those connections? How do you understand the meaning between what you're doing and why your employer should care about it. Um, and then start to be prepared to really see some either clear patterns come up um, or start to show uh, and understand whether or not that work is valued where you're working. Um, okay, I'm gonna see. If, okay, let's see if there's any, I think I have time for one or two more questions. Um, okay, so, Great one. Uh, with so many open source projects doing compelling work, how would you prioritize which to contribute to first? Um, this is actually really straightforward for me. Um, it's where you feel the most connected and where you feel the most valued and seen. Um, it, I, for me, I don't recommend that people join communities, groups, or projects where um, they feel like they have to work hard to make their contributions recognized. So if you are joining a community or a project where that's not valued or it's not done well, and if that's something you wanna work on and you want to, um, to make that a priority and if they're welcoming to that, I encourage that. But otherwise, uh, for me, the um, communities which do not put an emphasis on showing that uh, there's a wide community of people who are bringing forward um, what that project is uh, and not and are only highlighting maybe just a few key people. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't join those yet. 
unless they're looking for actively to change. Um, so uh, the Python programming language, the C Python uh, developer core, I would I would call out has been making some amazing um, strides in the last uh, few years, especially to grow a more diverse team with very focused initiatives. Um, the TensorFlow project uh, that Joanna and folks work on has also been doing some fantastic work to create a more diverse ecosystem in general. Um, so either of those I'd recommend as great starting places. So thank you all for joining me. Um, next up, I'll turn the floor over to Joanna Karaskea for the panel and fireside chat. Thank you.